Professor Colin Latcham is an Australian researcher and consultant who's been with us at the Commonwealth of Learning in Vancouver, Canada for the last one month, working on a very interesting project. Many of you will know that uh, the Commonwealth of Learning, or CALL, has developed several quality assurance toolkits in open and distance learning. These are specifically for open schooling, for teacher education, and higher education. But we didn't have anything for non-formal education, and there's a lot of work that we do in that area at the community level. So Professor Colin Latcham, or Colin as I'll call him, very kindly agreed to take this on, and he's been here working on that. So we'll talk about that today so that you know what it is that he exactly did. So my first question, Colin, is that um, why a quality assurance toolkit for non-formal education? Well, I became very interested in this. I'm very interested in quality assurance and have just co-authored a book on, on this subject. And we found that non-formal education uh, was, was an area that really was not being very well covered in the in in the literature, I think the last uh, work was by Tony Dodds about 1996 in this in this area. So that's quite some time, and I'd seen a number of uh, reports on non-formal um, education, and I, I was quite concerned because it seemed that very often the the quality. Uh, was not assured in these projects, which of course is a matter of concern because uh, it's not in itself a very um, high status uh, area and, and to try to get funding can be quite difficult. There are quite a lot of pilot projects rather than long-term sustained programs. So it's very important, I think, to, to assure all of the stakeholders that the money is being well spent and the outcomes that are required for non-formal education are being re realized. So what would you say is the difference in the quality assurance for non-formal education and quality assurance you know, for in an institutional context? Well, I think this is, this is what's made the project particularly interesting for me because it's really turned into quite a major research study. Uh, you know, basically, when you're looking at assuring quality in a university situation, which is basically my background, I mean, you're really looking to see whether the graduates have, have achieved the kind of outcomes that, that are expected, both in terms of the disciplines they studied and the kind of generic attributes that employers and society at large are, are requiring. Now, when you come to non-formal <coughs> education, um, th these outcomes are, uh, may not only be concerned with individuals but with whole communities. And, and so uh, because I was adopting an outcomes approach or rather to use the development terminology, the outputs, outcomes and impacts approach, what I had to do was to go and research what was actually happening in non-formal education and I found a really fascinating range of programs uh, going on from, from basic literacy right through to um, encouraging peace and reconciliation in war-torn communities, uh, helping people with work skills or to set up small to medium enterprises, um, through to the use of organizations like, like telecenters. So I had to work through all of these and, and look at the evaluations to work out what kind of outcomes were we actually talking about. And then having drawn those up, I then translated these into what we would either call key performance indicators or critical success factors. Very simple statements that can be based upon direct observation of documents or the learners or the community's uh, performance during and after the event. So are these generic enough because uh, non-formal education would cover so many different contexts? Well, there's quite an extensive list of suggested performance indicators, and I'm not suggesting that everybody should work with, with all of them. They're really indicating the kind of performance indicators that one would be looking for. And I've broken them down into three areas. First of all, there is the, the outputs or the outcomes or the impacts on the learners. Then there's the uh, what effect is, uh, how would you measure the quality of the actual uh, l learning provision, you know, the, the actual program. And then finally, uh, how would you judge the outcomes from the community level? And the outputs are short term, the outcomes are midterm, and the impacts are, are long term. So I'm really ad uh, advocating a, a, a pick and mix approach, and you even add your own. And then what I've done is provide a very, very simple uh, uh, matrix within which you can take note uh, and score 
uh, how these performance indicators have actually been, been achieved. Because a lot of the people this is aimed for are not full-time educators. They, they won't have large budgets. They will have very limited time. So my aim has been to give them a very simple toolkit that they can use in the field and yet give the necessary results. Because I imagine some of this will have to be translated into local languages because yes. we work with grassroots communities. Yes. But I think involving the partners, as you seem to say, is, is very important in this whole uh, enterprise. Yes. Who are the people who will be using this toolkit? Well, when you look at some of these uh, quality assurance reports and evaluations and audits, <coughs> one can see quite clearly that things went wrong right from the very beginning. So the first thing I'd say is that the quality assurance must be built into the very initial planning of the project. And, and then it should be monitored throughout the, the project and then uh, summatively uh, applied at the, at the end of the project. Now what this means then is that uh, the, the toolkit is really for policy policy makers and planners, but equally important, it's for the actual practitioners. So they must be trained in and familiarized with the quality audit system because they will be the people who are doing some of the monitoring and providing some of the reports. And without that, you have a really weak, weak link in the chain. So what are some of the other ways that uh, the planners and the practitioners are going to use this toolkit? Right from the beginning, as you say, that it's a good research instrument, it's a good uh, resource because it has case studies of what's happening in different projects, so it might trigger off good ideas in people, so it yes. becomes a good, useful planning. Yes. Well, I, I think it gives them a very, very clear step-by-step uh, uh, um, -step guide to the, you know, the steps to be go, th go through. I mean, for example, I, I've looked at the, the the types of data that you can gather up in the quality assurance process and the critical questions you need to ask yourself about the reliability and the effectiveness of, of gathering up data in those in those particular in those particular ways. I think the other thing that probably going back to your early question about how this differs from from higher education, higher education institutions and schools on the whole tend to operate on their own. Yes, okay, you know, the parents and the employers and the communities have a role. But when it comes to uh, non-formal education, very often there are all kinds of partnerships. For example, with the lifelong learning for farmers, critically important to have a partnership with the local banks who are going to provide the loans to the farmers to implement what they learned on the training, and also with the uh, mobile phone companies because the learners had said that this was the best way they could learn, so they had to be cheap, uh, to use uh, mobile phones. So in other words, part of the planning actually involves looking at the partners. And of course, the more partners you get in, the more important it is to make sure that the quality assurance system involves all of those partners as well as the sponsor or the provider. We're really looking for models that are shown to be working that are then not only sustainable but transferable so that other people can, can learn from successful projects. And sadly at the moment, that research, those findings, those quality assurances just aren't there. I think the data is very important, you know, mm. um, if we have to sort of uh, convince other people that this model works. Absolutely. They want evidence first. They must do. They must do. I mean, money is, is very constrained <coughs> and, uh, you know, we're competing against, uh, you know, all kinds of other demands for, for valuable resources. And yet, when you look at non-formal education, as I see it, when we look globally throughout the whole Commonwealth, you know, higher education, schools is really the tip of an iceberg and below that we have a mass of people who, who need to be helped to become literate, to be more aware of how to conduct health care, uh, who need to be helped to build their communities to be self-sustaining and, and so on. And my feeling is that you know we, we really need to focus much more on that but if we're going to do it we must do it really well. I think that's very important, especially getting the partners on the same page. Yes, absolutely. Because um, ultimately it's the partners who will generate the data in the field. Yes, yes. And they are the ones who should be convinced because they are the ones who deliver. And it's through them that, you know, organizations like Call and other development agencies work. So um, I think this toolkit is meant uh, primarily 
for the partners? Well, I, I think it's for the I think it's for the proposers of projects. You know, if if somebody is applying for funding, I think they should be uh, capable of signing up to an agreement. This is how we're going to do it, and these are the results we're going to we're going to provide. Then I think the actual partners, yes, as you say, must be all on the same page, um, and then. Uh, the communities themselves need to know because a, a lot of these non-formal education programs, I mean take telecenters, they depend enormously upon community support and community input. I mean I suppose this is another big difference going back to your early question between non-formal education and, and formal education. This is really starting with learners' needs or community needs. You don't start with a set curriculum or an agreement on what it is that's going to be. So there has to be uh, a great deal of involvement of the community in actually planning the programs. And as we saw with lifelong learning for farmers, which I thought was wonderful, it's now reached a stage where the farmers themselves are running their own training website and producing their own training videos for use on mobile phones. Well, that's where you've got evidence that something is really taking off. That's an impact. Right. That that's that. It really is an impact. You know, I is. mean, um, two thousand women have generated over two point five million Canadian in the last yeah. four years. So that is a very major yes. impact. Yes. Yes. And we hope that we'll be able to uh, run similar projects uh, much better, more effectively, with more value for money uh, by using this toolkit. So thank you very much, Colin, well, for Well, thank you very much indeed. And it's been a wonderful time. I mean, it's a very here. valuable piece of work. So Good. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.